I'll start by thanking Rick for inviting me here today. Uh, so Dallas County Community College District has a somewhat of a special place, I guess, for me. Uh, I started, okay, that's not true. I actually started college in Georgia and, and spent a summer session that did not end really well. And so then I went into service and then when I got through with that and came out, then I started college at Mountain View. And so I spent two years there before transferring to UT Dallas. And then uh, I started teaching at Brookhaven uh, as an adjunct a few years later and uh, through uh, connections. That always helps. So I don't know how many of you remember Gene Gibbons, but when I, was, when I uh, worked at the VA office at Mountain View when I was a student there, he was the evening dean. And so we spent a lot of time in the hallway at night shooting the breeze about whatever, uh, drinking coffee and smoking cigars. You could do that in the building then. And uh, those were the good old days. And, uh, and then he moved to Brookhaven when it opened. And then later uh, he was Dean of Social and Behavioral Sciences. And so he hired me to teach uh, government there as an adjunct. All right. And then uh, the rest of it, as they say, is history. Uh, so. What I'm, what I'm going to do is I will tell you that this will end up in an unabashed, uh, although is, is abash, is that actually a word? Is it? Unabashed, unabashed is, but is abash a word? Because usually when you have a prefix like un in front of it, there is another word. that. you ever been invited to abash? <laughs> that's different, yeah. But see, that's two words. Okay, so, okay, see. Uh, so. See, I learned something in college, all right? It's an archaic word. I'm sure it is, but it is a word. Yeah. Okay. So this will end up in an unabashed uh, commercial for fields of study. And hopefully I'll tell you why we should embrace these things as, as I go along here. So, uh, and I'll connect all this to guided pathways eventually. And so closing the gaps. So I don't know how many of you remember the previous 15-year higher education strategic plan, Closing the Gaps. Uh, some of us have been around long enough to remember that. But it focused on uh, access, okay? And its number one goal was participation, and the whole idea behind it was to increase participation in higher education, which it did. Uh, it, it, in the end, it fell just a few thousand students short of meeting every goal except the one for uh, Hispanic males, I think it is. And uh, people at the coordinating board have told me that whenever I talk about this, I should remind everybody that we fell short of a goal that was actually raised from the beginning. So we actually, the and goals, uh, goals actually increased over time. Uh, and so we fell a little bit short, and of course that occurred at the, uh, when the, everything was coming out of recession and so forth, and so enrollments actually declined, uh, particularly at community colleges in Texas. So, uh, but, it, but its number one focus was on participation, and then it had some uh, look at success in terms of completion and that kind of thing, and then uh, excellence had to do with uh, hiring faculty and uh, getting recognition and stuff, and then research had to do with getting more money for research. So, uh, and now we're in 60 by 30 which is the current 15-year higher education strategic plan. <clears throat> and it's shifted its focus from access to success, which is one of the movements in, in higher education. So, I mean, I think two things have happened in higher education, particularly at community colleges in the last 20 years or so, is the shift from promoting access to success is one of them. Uh, and I worked at Austin Community College in the days when uh, we had telephone registration Okay, that was a long time ago, right? But, the, but telephone registration actually had a really neat feature to it, and that was it would tell us whenever a student tried to register for a class, right? And it kept track of that. So we knew how many times someone had tried to register for a 10 o'clock American government class Monday, Wednesday, Friday at the Northridge campus. And so it gave very detailed information and about what students were trying to get into and where and when. And we, and we went to web registration, we lost all of that detail. Uh, so telephone registration actually had one uh, a really good upside to it, and that was we got really good information. 
And one of the things we found out was that we turned away three to 5,000 students every semester. Tried to register for a class in one or more classes and never wound up enrolling in anything because they couldn't get what they wanted when they wanted it, where they wanted it. Right? And once we found out we, had, we were losing three to 4,000 every semester, advertising just came to a halt. Right? It's like, well, why advertise for something you can't fill anyway? So it turns out we didn't have to advertise. And we still turned away three to 5,000 students every semester because we didn't have any place to put them right, at the times they wanted to go. Now, you still couldn't make a class at 4.15 in the afternoon, no matter what. And we even did that deal where one time where we offered reduced tuition for afternoon classes. And what happened was all the international students moved to the, inter to the afternoon classes because they weren't allowed by law to work anyway, so they could go to class any time they wanted to. And they got reduced tuition out of it. And so they moved to the afternoon, and then we couldn't get classes to make at 8 o'clock in the morning. So it was like, well, okay, never mind. All the time we're turning away three to 5,000 students every semester nevertheless. But, but it struck me later uh, that one of the things we never ask about, because at the same time we're analyzing all this data, we also knew that we were also bringing in 10 to 11,000 new students every fall semester. Now at that time enrollment was probably around 25 to 30,000 total uh, for the whole college. And no one ever asked the question of, how is it that we have room for 11,000 new students every semester? Well, the answer to that is, is we have room for 11,000 students every fall semester because we weren't keeping very many from one fall to the next fall or even fall to spring. And nobody ever really got into the persistent rate, right? Or sometimes uh, called the retention rates. So, uh, so the coordinating board made a switch from the nomenclature of retention to persistence because if you tell a high school crowd, so for them, see for us, retention was a good thing, but if you're retaining students in secondary, that's bad, okay, mm -hmm. right? That means they've been kept behind a grade. So retention there has a negative connotation to it. So everybody uses persistence now. But persistence rates were, were not very good. All right? And nobody ever looked at that. I mean, until much later. But at the time, nobody ever thought about, well, why aren't we keeping more of the students that we have? And part of it was we had more than we knew what to do with anyway. So, you know, on some level it was like, eh, I don't know. we don't need them anyway. We got, you know, we can't. Fill up all, we fill up all the slots we got and don't have room for the demand that we have and so why worry about this stuff. But part of the reason we didn't worry about it because it was not part of the culture to do so. All right? So this was in the day, and I worked for a president who, who, who he and I argued on a regular basis about a student's right to fail. And, and his, his basic premise was we open the door, we let them in, they go to class, they learn, they learn, they don't learn, they don't learn, whichever is fine, that's their problem, not ours. And students have a right to fail. Uh, he almost treated it as a privilege more than a right, in a sense. But what he hadn't, in his mind, he hadn't made that shift from access to success. And let's talk about not only are students getting in, but what are we doing about getting them out at the same time? How many of them are getting out? And, and when I say get out, I don't mean it, we just let them take a few classes and then ushered them out, out the door, but that we actually ushered them out the door with a credential in their hand. So 60 by 30 was conceived to look at this. So educated population is really what we used to call the 60 by 30 goal, but it, it, took, it took us a couple of, almost three years to figure out that if you call your plan the same thing as you call your first goal, that leads to confusion. Okay. <laughs> I won't even, it, it, there are a lot of brilliant people at the court board. Okay, um, and then, so that one, that one essentially says by 2030, 60% of 25 to 34 year olds will have a credential of some kind, and that can be a level one, a level two certificate, associate's degree, bachelor's, master's, doctorate. So we count them all, and we count them from whatever source they come from, public, private, 
out of state, in state. So if someone is 30 years old and they move into Texas and they have a credential in the year 2030, they're going to get counted. Okay. So we, immigration is a good thing. We like it. Uh, we count it all because actually, after all, they're here and they're contributing to the economy. Or at least most of them are anyway. I mean, my nephew could move back, and I guarantee you, he will not be contributing to the economy. Okay? So, if he does, I'll be completely surprised. All right? So, that's the educated population. Completion, though, is on schools in Texas, because that says by 2030, we will have 550,000 students a year will be getting some kind of credential from the state of Texas. And we count private institutions in that as well, okay? And we also count uh, for-profits that report to us. How you doing? All right. And so uh, <coughs> that's the completion goal, but that's really up on institutions to actually get people to the system and then through the system as well, all right? So, uh, and then marketable skills is this thing about uh, students exit college knowing something and uh, we should be able to help them articulate what it is that they know in a language that employers can understand. All right. And that's really what's behind marketable skills. And a lot of this came about, about the time this plan was being crafted, there was a lot of discussion in the, in the news media about whether college was worth it or not, and particularly about whether things like liberal arts degrees were worth it or not. And so having a liberal arts degree, all of my degrees are in political science. Uh, I was somewhat offended by that uh, because, you know, I've managed to, now I mean, now one can certainly debate about whether being at the coordinating board is, is the height of a career or not, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, but, I, but I've been gainfully employed for a lot of years now and, <laughs> and paying taxes and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know. Now, interestingly enough, though, I have three degrees, but none of them have ever counted anywhere because I was a first-time, full-time student at Mountain View, but I did not get a degree from there. And so in, in the iPad system, then I don't count for anything because since I didn't get a degree from there, then I, I lost. I'm, that's it. So none of those other degrees have ever showed up in any statistics anywhere from the federal government. But in Texas, we count all of that. Uh, so the state actually accounts for all of those things. Uh, and then the debt goal is simply that we keep debt where it's at in terms of a percentage for students. Texas is one of the states that has a very low debt rate now among the, the 50 states. And so part of the idea is to keep it at least where it's at, if not decrease it, uh, but at least not let it grow anymore. And that's pegged at 60% of a student's uh, first year of earnings. Okay. So, so in, a, in all this, in about... While all this stuff is going on about shifting from access to success, so guided pathways becomes the buzzword for how do you talk about and denote the shift from access to success. And I can tell you that, you know, having been in the business for a long time, and, and I'll tell you, I've been at the coordinating board, I, I'll make a couple of quick disclaimers here. I've been at the coordinating board not quite five years. And so when I give you my unabashed commercial for FOS, I'll, I want you to understand that that's not a position I arrived at since I went to the coordinating board. That's a position I've had probably for 15 years, 10 years, if not longer prior to that. Uh, and one of the reasons I went to the coordinating board is because uh, they deal with policy. Now we deal with a lot of mundane stuff, but we also deal with policy and legislatures and that kind of thing. And so part, part of my interest in going there was uh, so can I have some ability to actually affect the policy that surrounds this kind of thing? And I'll talk some more about specifics in a moment. Uh, but guided pathways is that, I mean, and all of you are involved in this in some way or another, and so you know what I'm talking about, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it, it's really that intentional notion of you take a student when they come in, or even before they come in, and you help them get in, and then you actually try to do something to make sure that they get out. And so the guided pathways part of it is, is you actually put them on some kind of pathway that makes sense for them in terms of what they want to do, uh, what their goals are, what their abilities are to some extent. You know. 
uh, and then you're going to help them get there. And that takes a lot of different forms of helping them with an application in the first place. Uh, so how many of you were first time college students? Yeah, well, me too. Okay. In my family, I'm the only one in my family that's ever gotten a doctorate. And there's only two other, I have 30 some odd cousins. 35, I think. No, there's more than that. Well, anyway, 35 to 40 cousins, first cousins. Okay. Uh, most of which are still alive. And uh, I'm the only one that's ever uh, gotten a doctorate. And only two others have ever uh, got a master's degree. So the family on both sides, both my mother's side and my, my father's side, uh, spawned a lot of first generation college students. My father graduated from high school when he was 39 years old. He went to night school for three years at Crozier Tech in Dallas and, uh, and got his high school diploma, started when he was 36 and finished when he was 39. Uh, and you know, he never talked to me about that at all, unless I asked him something, he never mentioned it. And, and I think in a lot of ways, that's part of the beginning of what taught me that education was such a good deal. That and spending the summer breaking up an asphalt yeah. parking lot with pan tools. And I thought, well, cr you know, crap, this is a lot more work than I ever want to do. So, <laughs> than this. <laughs> but, you know, helping students with financial aid. All right. Um, my daughter, my oldest daughter, is in the medical field. And she had her last two years of college were paid for through a grant from the federal government because of health professions. But to get there, you had to fill out the FAFSA. And, you know, I've been in higher education for a long time. I've worked with financial aid folks a long time. I, you know, I thought, okay, I, I got this, right? Jeez. You know, you need a degree in this stuff to fill these things out. Uh, like, this is the most difficult piece of paper I've ever filled out. It was worse than applying for a mortgage, okay, which used to be really bad. Uh, but now that everybody knows, you know, what you do and what you don't do, when I told somebody the other day, I said, you know, Big Brother is watching us. It just never occurred to us it would be Google. <laughs> you know, we always thought it'd be the government. Well, no, it's the private sector is the one that's got the goods on us. Okay. But advising it turns out to be an, an intentional advising about trying to help students figure out what they want to do and what they need to take to get there is, is most important. Uh, you know, I was very lucky when I transferred from Mountain View to UT Dallas because they just wanted you to have 60 hours of passing grades, all right? And <laughs> by the way, I just, I was, now all mine were passing, but you know, it's, but I had a friend of mine who didn't quite have that many, but anyway. Uh, they wanted you to have 60 hours, and they expected some of that to be English and sort of what we would think of as the basics in our head. And, uh, but otherwise, they didn't really care what the 60 hours were. They took 60 hours as a block, and then you had to take 60 more hours. And you had every right to fail there, I might add. Uh, and so, uh, so it was kind of simple. The transfer process was very simple for me. It, most of the time, it is not anywhere near that simple for most students. Right? And you all know this. But this is a part of that notion of guided pathways. And so then the question of, so how far can we get with this? As an institution, you can get students in your door and you can get them to the back door, you know, on their way out, so to speak. But then you're stymied for a lot of different reasons. All right? And so that, and that's sort of that part about, well, how far can we go from there? So, you know, getting from the sending institution to the receiving institution has long depended on two things. One is we'll create a bunch of transfer guides, which may or may not still be good when we get finished with them. Okay? And we'll have some articulation agreements, which often don't amount to, and we just completed a study of this and looked at a bunch of articulation agreements, and I can tell you that a lot of them don't amount to any more than saying, if you send us your students, and if they're qualified, then we might take them. <laughs> and that, that's really what, in, and there'll be 10 pages of that, but that's what it boils down to. Okay, at the end of the day, that's what it all means. You send them to us, and they're qualified, and we got a place for them, we'll let them in. Okay, well, that's hardly worth the paper it's written on in terms of getting a student 
through college in the most efficient manner, right? And you know, and this whole thing about debt is, is one of the reasons we need to be concerned about efficiency is because it costs a damn much to go to college anymore. Uh, it's an expensive proposition. And you know, one of the things that, that we were tasked with the legislature this last time around and wound up in my division with this whole project about open education resources. And so we conducted a, a feasibility study and we got a grant out to develop open education resources. And we have an exceptional item request. Exceptional item request is where you ask for more money than what you've already got. And uh, so I asked for $250,000 to actually open a repository and maintain it. And then another, and another uh, total and then another 200 on top of the 200,000 we already have. So a total of 400,000 for grants to faculty to develop open education resources. Because at a community college, your textbooks can cost more than your tuition and fees do. And, and, and I was a co-author on a textbook once. And I can tell you, it's a game. Now, it, it's, it can be a lucrative game, by the way. I mean, I was, I was one of three authors, and we probably made ten, eleven thousand dollars $11,000 a year off that thing for a while. But it but quickly became, well, we want you to, it was a Texas government textbook, and we want you to revise this every three years and then put out a supplemental edition every time there's an election so we can keep new books on the market all the time, you know, so it keep you churning. And it's like, that is absolutely absurd to do that. Um, a government textbook should never be revised no more, I, I mean, every four years, at the most, after a state election or after a national election. There is absolutely no reason to revise one in between, none. I'm not even sure there's a reason to revise one after four years, by the way. But that would be the, that would be the bottom. But so that stuff is there. So it's expensive. So we got to figure out how to get to them. So those have been our two major ways to try to get students through and help them, right? I saw a transfer guide the other day. Actually, I've seen two in the last couple of months. And institution came to the coordinating board and they were presenting about all this stuff. And then they passed out their transfer guides. And at the top of that transfer guide, in bold black letters, was recommended. And I thought, well, OK, that helps. But it's not the solution to this, I don't think. I uh, saw one the other day, and at the very top of it was a disclaimer that said, basically said, this may or may not be good. <laughs> like, well, you know, that's what I want. And then, oh, and then, then there's an aside to all this. We increasingly have catalogs that reinforce this, by the way. You should check out your own institution's catalog. <laughs> See how many of them have a disclaimer on the very first pages that essentially says, this catalog means nothing because we can change it anytime we want to. Anytime. Okay? It is not a contract, and there'll be a whole paragraph of this language. I've read many of them that says, in effect says, this, this is not a contract. This catalog means nothing. It may be good while you're looking at it. Maybe, but you might ought to check the web or someplace and then hope and pray that the web is actually up to date, right? And then, then later in the catalog, it'll tell you, though, that you can graduate under any catalog in the previous five years. Well, can you? Well, not if they want to go back and say, well, but see on page one, it says, can't do that. I actually had a case with a private institution that went all the way to the Attorney General's office about that very issue. Okay, the, the student in the end caved in and, and acquiesced to the college, uh, unfortunately, I think. But so anyway, there, there are real problems with this that you all know of, right? So how do, we, how do we get there? There are limitations to this. So in creating effective seamless transition is difficult uh, at best, right? And there's a lot of reasons for that. This astounds people from out of the state of Texas. It actually amazes a lot of people in Texas. We have 61 systems of higher education in the state. Did you all know that? See, most of you didn't know that either. I wasn't fully aware of this until I went to work at the coordinating board and really began to analyze it. 61. We have 50 community colleges, every one of which in Texas is a local government, each with its own board of trustees, right? There's 50 systems right there. There is no coordination between them, only what the coordinating board provides through statute. We have six university systems, UT, A&M, University of North Texas, Texas Tech, 
Texas State, University of Houston. We have four independent universities, four-year universities, that are not part of any one of those six systems. Texas Women's, Stephen F. Austin, Texas Southern, Midwestern University. And you were saying? Baylor? Baylor? Private. That's private. private. Yeah. So this is just public, by the way, just 61 systems in public. And then we have one more. What is that? Anybody know? Texas State Technical College System. Okay? So we have 61 systems in this state. Now, can you imagine what trying to coordinate 61 systems is like? And I'll guarantee you that those systems don't act like systems most of the time either. I had a vice chancellor of one of the major systems tell me one day, he said, look, we got X number of colleges in this system, and I can guarantee you that no two of them are do anything alike. And I said, okay, well, good. That'll get us where we want to be, right? In this state, we have 150 majors, at least. So I counted these one day. I didn't have anything else to do. And so I thought, so I went through our system, and what I did was I, and this, oh, this is just bachelor's degrees, by the way. This does not include certificates, doesn't include associates, doesn't include master's or doctoral degrees, just bachelor's degrees. And I tried to eliminate, I, I tried to only count once those places where you can get a BA and a BS in the same thing. So I just counted that as one major. I counted 133 at A&M and 132 at UT Austin. Well, I figured, well, they're the biggest. They probably got, you know, this is probably a representative sample, right, of, of most of them. And I was really tempted to call UT and tell them they needed to send in a proposal for one more or two more so they could be ahead of A&M <laughs> uh, in that regard. But I didn't, didn't, and I thought, no, it, this is too many already. And, and by the way, because A&M and UT don't have perfect overlap, right? I mean, A&M has a lot of agricultural degrees, for example. UT has Austin, is, this is UT Austin, so, and UT Austin has no agricultural degrees at all, all right? So there's, there's, some, there's a lot of overlap, but there's also a lot of distinction. So that's why, that's why there's a question mark behind it, 150, because I really don't know how many there are. Uh, I probably should. That stuff falls under my domain at the coordinating board, but, you know, I mean, it took me a while to count up that 132 and 133 uh, and so forth. Cultures are a really big problem here. So uh, a couple of years ago, I was testifying before the Senate uh, Higher Education Committee, and we got, I know it was the Senate Finance Committee. And I was testifying about our field of study legislation. And then one of the senators said, well, we've been working on transfer for 20 years. Why haven't y'all solved this yet? And I thought, well, why are you asking me this? And I looked around because I was hoping he was asking somebody else, but he wasn't. Uh, and I, so I, I told him, I said, you know, fundamentally the problem is this. We have 61 systems, but we have a culture in which we have a 100-year-plus culture because some of these institutions go back a long, long way, right? So we have a 100-year-plus culture in this state of every institution gets to do what it wants to do. Even within those systems, we have a culture of every institution gets to do what it wants to do. And so we have never really tried to tackle anything, or very little, if anything, on a statewide basis. And so you can go to some states, and they have already done all this work because that state has a single system. Kentucky, Kansas, there's a bunch of them. Nobody comes close to 61. Even California, they only have three. They have the University of California system, California State system, and their community college system. They have three systems. As big as it is, that's all they have. Uh, so we have these limitations, and culture is a big issue. You know, when you are very used to doing whatever you want to do, that's hard. When I went to the coordinating board, my biggest transition was going from spending, I, before that I spent eight years as a VP for instruction, and before that I spent eight years as a dean. And so for 16 years, the reality is I did pretty much whatever I wanted to. And sometimes I had to check with people above me, sometimes, most of the time I didn't. I had a lot of freedom I had a, to do whatever I wanted to do. 
sometimes that worked out well, sometimes it didn't, but okay. All right, so, but when I went to the coordinating board, I'm now in a regulatory body. And so it's a very different environment where what you say to people is the law. And in, you know, it, it took me a while to figure out in some ways that's really true. So when someone sends me an email and says, what does this mean? Can we do this? Can we do that? And I tell them yes or no, or yeah, that's what that means. Then as far as they're concerned, that is what that means. And, and in fact, I've spoken, uh, and, and that's, that's sort of weird, I know, but it's, I mean, it strikes me as being kind of weird anyway. Uh, but it comes with the office, okay? I mean, it's not me, it's, it's the, the office that I occupy. Uh, and so it's a very different thing. But out there, everybody's used to doing whatever they want to do. Okay? So you have a big cultural problem here. So how do we overcome that? Well, we have statewide policy in three areas that try to deal with this issue of how do you create a guided pathway that's actually a pathway you can say to a student, this is it. You take these courses and they're going to transfer and they're going to apply. Okay? One is core curriculum. Now, I'd be the first to admit that core curriculum is somewhat of a mess, okay? We're trying our best to clean it up. I will accept some responsibility for that being a mess in the interest of full disclosure. Before I went to the coordinating board, I co-chaired the UEAC committee that created the current iteration of the core. Uh, and so, and there are some things that happened with it that probably should not have happened, but we're, we're trying to back up some. And you know, it's like once you tell somebody they can do something, and then you try to tell them you can't do that anymore, that's hard, right? Yeah. It's much easier, right? I mean, when I taught, you know, I started classes just tough as nails. Because I realized that I can always lighten up. I cannot get tougher. That ain't gonna work. You can try it, but it doesn't work well. And for those of you who taught, you know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? So the core is, was designed as a transfer mechanism. And the, the reasoning behind it was that there's a basic set of courses that everybody has to take anyway. It's what we generally refer to as general education. All right. Sachs has embodied a general education requirement since anybody can remember. All right. 30 hours at the baccalaureate level, 15 hours at the associate degree level. And as, as a, a a, a mother one time put it to me, at a, I was speaking to a group of people from Hunt County delegation or something, and she looked at me and she said, well, what about the basics? Aren't the basics the basics? And I had to say, well, not exactly, <laughs> because they're not. If you look at the core curriculum in Texas right now, there's probably, we, I can guarantee you that 12 hours of that will, can be a, taken and guarantee that it will be applied to a degree later. And what 12 hours are those? Six hours of American government, six hours of American history. Because they're in legislation for the 1930s that everybody wants a degree in Texas, you gotta have that, okay? I can't even guarantee English. Most, for most institutions I can, but not for all of them, all right? So it's a very difficult thing, and we're trying to tighten that up to make it more the basics. Uh, we have a legislative uh, request, we call it, to change some of the language in the legislation that makes it much more explicit that these should be lower division courses and that they should be a part of the ACGM, TCC, and S. That doesn't preclude people from putting or asking to have courses added to the ACGM. There's a process for that already, and so we can see how that goes. Uh, but the core is one of those things. Field of study is another. And so fields of study essentially say, the law says that if a student finishes a field of study or any course within a field of study, it must transfer, to, when it transfers to an institution, it must be transferred and applied to that major. Right? So there's a lot of four-year institutions out there who say, well, we're not gonna take that. Well, you don't, you don't have any choice in it, okay? The statute is there. It, it actually, it's been there for like 16 years now. But it was a little used mechanism for this. We now have about 20 of these things. Well, that's not quite true. We will, uh, October board meeting, we should, there's two more. Anyway, by January, we're, 
board meeting, we should have 20 to 25. We just looked at the top 25 majors, and that's what we're focusing on. So we looked at uh, majors declared by students at a community college, declared when they went to a four-year, and then what they graduated in. And the lists are very similar, which kind of tells you that students don't change their major near as often as everybody claims they do. Right? Because when you talk about excess hours for students, remember in Texas, for a 120-hour degree, the average student graduates with over 100, without 140. If they took dual credit, they graduate with 146. Okay, and so there's a lot of excess hours there. Uh, we figured that costs the state a minimum of 59 million dollars a year in funding. It costs parents and students, and guardians, and whoever's paying the bill for the tuition and fees for this stuff. It costs them that much or more equal to that. Educate Texas estimates there's 120 million a year lost in what we now call excess hours. Uh, Senator West from Dallas refers to those as stranded hours, which I think is kind of interesting. All the information we have about this is only from students who actually graduated, by the way. So that's 140 excess hours for students who actually graduated with a, with a bachelor's degree at the end, okay? Not everybody graduates. 70% of community college students enter community college claiming they want a four-year degree. We get about 20, 25% of them to a four-year institution. Once they get there, most of them actually graduate, but we don't get very many over there. Something happens in between. Some of that is life, by the way. Some of it is the expense, but some of it may also be, damn, I racked up a lot of hours that aren't gonna count, and I gotta go to work. I can't afford to do this any longer. I don't want to do this any longer. I mean, who knows? So we lose a lot in the translation. We're trying to look into some of that and figure out how much impact that has on students who never actually go in and graduate, or never graduate. Uh, but fields of study refer to transfer. Programs of study do the same thing at the two-year level. So this is Associate of Applied Science degrees, where we're trying to standardize some curriculum across the state. Nobody likes this stuff because it interferes with what does it interfere with? Faculty, faculty yeah, faculty low, but also uh, on fields of study, what is it that faculty are the first to scream about? Academic. academic freedom. You're stomping all over my academic freedom. This has absolutely nothing to do with academic freedom. Academic freedom has never touched this issue and probably never will. But it's a, you know, but I, if I was a faculty member once, that's the first thing I would have brought up. I mean, I get it. I don't blame them. I mean, like, I understand that. Okay. I also understand the desire to keep doing what I want to do and the desire to keep doing it the way I've done it. Because after all, we do it at my institution the way we do it because it is the best way to do it. <laughs> right? And if some other institution is not doing it the way we do it, then obviously they're not doing it the best way. Okay. I mean, faculty are prima donnas. I was one of them, I know. All right. Departments are prima donnas. Institutions are prima donnas, all right? I mean, it goes on and on. But it's a very difficult thing. And what we're asking institutions to do is to change the way they do business. And this is hard stuff. It is difficult to say to them, you, what you used to do on a departmental basis at most is now going to have to be done on a statewide basis. You're going to have to come together and agree about what the curriculum should be. Now, the fascinating part to me, and I've listened to a lot of this, I've spoken to a lot of field study committees, I've listened to a lot of them, and what I find fascinating is that they rarely get into arguments about the subject matter content of their discipline. They don't argue a whole lot about what the tenets of history ought to be, or math. Uh, Mechanical engineering really stands out in my mind because they got into this really extended argument about whether motors should be in the curriculum or not. And I kept thinking, no, I'm not a mechanical engineer, but damn, doesn't, doesn't motors have, I mean, isn't a lot of what mechanical engineers do involve motors? Move stuff all over, I mean, right, all over the place. And, but they decided that they didn't know whether that should really be in the curriculum or not. And really what it turned out to be was they were arguing about whether it should be a separate course or not. Now, that's a little bit different issue, right? Most of these committees will argue about things like, well, in my institution, see, we teach that in the second year, not in the first year. 
or we teach it in the first year, not the second year. Or we teach that as upper division, not lower division. And our lower division, not upper division. I can tell you, two-year schools are just as bad as the four-year schools are in this, by the way. Everybody wants to do what they want to do. Two-year institutions want to grab as many courses as they can. Four-year institutions want to do what they want to do. They want to grab as many courses as they can. So it's hard to reach some consensus, but at the end of the day, they usually do. Now, uh, we're going to have to sustain this effort and keep it going. Uh, and th this is going to be tough, and it really is asking faculty, because these committees are made up of faculty members. I, mean, I, I don't know anything about mechanical engineering. No. If I do know anything about it, it would be just enough to really mess up something. All right? And so if I'm going to create a mechanical engineering field of study, I need to have mechanical engineers in the room who can tell me what this discipline is about and can tell me what should be a part of this discipline. What's the subject matter content of this? How do we put that stuff into courses? How do we turn it into student learning outcomes and make it work? So the, the fields of study and programs of study do this stuff at different levels. Uh, it's very difficult work, and it's going to require people to change their, their mindset about how this works. They're going to have to be willing to give up some of the autonomy that they've had to a bigger group. And that's difficult. When I was in college, well, when I was in school, period, at anywhere from elementary on up through college, the one thing I hated the most was working in a group. I mean, I'm sorry, but one of the reasons I turned out to be a social scientist is because it by generally was a very solitary profession <laughs> in a lot of ways, right? Uh, that's my personality. Now, over the years, I've had to learn how to work with groups and how to deal with groups and that kind of stuff, and I think that I'm sort of okay at it. Uh, but I understand where people come from with this, and I understand what we're asking them to do. And so, you know, that's why this is not a bash commercial for this stuff, right? Because I think if you really want to create a guided pathway that will make a student's journey from where they enter to where they exit, and you want it to be as efficient as possible in terms of as few semester credit hours, as little debt as possible, and as, and as timely as it can be, uh, we are going to have to shift what we do from everybody does their own thing to we're going to have to cooperate more on a statewide level to make sure this happens. 75% or 70% of students who get a bachelor's degree in Texas have hours from a community college. 35% of all students who get a bachelor's degree in Texas have 30 or more hours from a community college. Right. So the two-year to four-year transition has, is, is something we need to deal with, and it's problematic. And the other piece of this is actually our studies on transfer suggest that transferring from a, a two- to a four-year institution is problematic. Transferring from a two to from a four year to a four year is actually more problematic than from a two to a four. And transferring from a two to a two is even more problematic than that. And that's part of what uh, the, the part of what persuaded us to start looking at programs of study and trying to do something about that uh, across the state. Not to mention the fact that employers like the idea of having people that they can hire from anywhere in the state out of a particular program and at least they have the basis of their knowledge is the same regardless. And I've had at least one employer explicitly say that to me at a, a meeting. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peebles. Thank you so much. Thank you.